Davis is back from Rose Holman. Yay. I told you I'm unprofessional. It's off the cuff. What's going on? Uh, happy to be on again and, and talk some ball. Yeah, I'm getting back into podcasting. You're my first. I've had like six people cancel in the past two weeks. I must suck now. <laughs> And then when you texted me to go back at one, I was like, everyone's going to cancel because I said something to offend somebody at some point on Twitter. Maybe because I said inside zone looks like duo. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no line coach will want to come on anymore. Uh, I, I don't know. I was supposed to have one yesterday uh, and he didn't come on. I'm like, I must have offended him. Um. So I think I wanted to know, we were just talking about it, that's why I wanted to start recording, because last time I talked to you, you were getting ready to start your season, I think, at some yep. point. So we were just talking a little bit about it. So how did your guys' thing go with COVID? Like, how were you able to practice? How did your games go and all that? Yeah, so our school had, like, a locker room restriction. Uh, we were actually allowed to use our locker room, which I know a lot of high school teams didn't. Uh, but uh, we could have uh, 40 guys in our locker room at a time, so we actually started our – Offensive practice 15 minutes earlier and got the offensive guys out and then allowed that time for the defense to then get in the locker room, get ready, and then brought the defense out, which it actually ended up being a, a plus in my mind because once practice was over, the offense needed 15, 20 minutes to get in and get a shower. And we were able to use our facility for that, but that gave us circuit training time for our defense. Um, we obviously had the same amount of practice time, but it's nice when – half the team's not there and you have the whole entire field for certain drills. So uh, that went well. Um, we were supposed to play seven games. We ended up playing only five. One team had a injury issue, not a COVID issue and, and backed out of the, one of the games. And then another team had a uh, COVID issue that we found out on Wednesday, even though they hadn't practiced about half the week, but uh, I'd sat down and broke down. I think 350 pass clips just to be like, all right, on to the next week. But uh, so everything went pretty well. Um, most of our issues, if, if we would have had to play a fall season, and I think you guys probably would have attest to this, it would have been a lot tougher. So our whole school was testing. So in the fall, we had a lot of kids missing a lot of times, and we would have been a much different team week to week in the fall than in the spring. We had very few issues on campus and within our program. So um, the teams that did play in the fall, if their schools tested and stuff, you probably were a lot different than what a, a team in the spring was playing because we were very, uh, I think we had one, maybe two issues the whole entire spring, uh, where in the fall it was about 50% of our team had some sort of contact tracing or, or got COVID at some point. Yeah, like, yeah, like did your kids actually go into the class or were they – Oh, yeah, our kids, yeah, our kids have to go. Oh, yes, yeah. Or like, were they remote? They went in person, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Our, our kids went in person. They, they had some hybrid uh, classes where uh, you spend all this money to go to college, and they, they, the professor records. It doesn't even do it live. Records the class, and then you're supposed to watch it and, and do the homework. But uh, most, uh, I think, about fifty percent were in person classes. The other fifty percent were uh, hybrid classes. So our, our kids were. We're in school. We're getting tested every week. And, uh, in fact, we just had graduation outside with no masks um, if, if the kids were vaccinated for uh, graduation. I don't think they were checking any records or anything because I don't remember seeing many pictures with kids with masks on. But uh, uh, we were pretty strict as a university, which which was good because we had very few problems. Yeah, but I can now not wear a mask in store. It's been two weeks since I got back that my second shot. Because I got COVID back in January, February. It was not fun. It is not a fun, fun time. My smell is still messed up. My wife has lost her uh, her uh, taste of peanut butter and of uh, onions. She thinks it smells or tastes rotten. So that that sucks. For me, it's um, if you walk into a restaurant and you can smell things like being made far away, I can't smell it. It has to be in my vicinity. Like, it's very strange. Like, at practice, somebody was grilling, I guess, and someone goes, can you smell that? And I was like, no. What are you guys <laughs> talking about? Uh, and that's the only reason why I got the vaccine was because I was like, I never want to get COVID ever again. 
ever. It was terrible. And but now I can not wear. I went to the gym this morning with no mask, and I was like, "This is strange." <laughs> we were walking around our grocery store last night, and we're like, this is weird. Like, I feel like I need to have my mask on. Yeah, at school we still have to have it on right now. But I'm waiting for that day when you walk to practice and you don't have to have it. Um, it comes off a little bit, but no, no. In football, I was on all the time. I never took it off to yell. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> Ever. No, um, from what, everything we understand, outside our, our kids for next fall will not have to use it. Uh, we'll be able to travel as, as normal, we, we think. And uh, just maybe kids that didn't get vaccinated will have to wear a mask and, and do some different things for travel. But we should be pretty back to normal next fall. Now, did you guys have the masks on the the, 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 the face mask? No. Or was it was an actual mask. We were actual mask. Uh, that was more of a school rule. Um, when we were playing away games, our kids could have gators and stuff, but the school were, rule was we, we bought like 900 gators from uh, uh, Europe or Asia or somewhere. I think it was from Asia somewhere. And then the school said, oh, no, gators, you can't use those. So we had 900 gators sitting in our cage, and we ended up giving them out for the first away game because that was the first time our kids were able to use those. But Yeah, Illinois coaches couldn't wear those on the sideline. It had to be like actual masks, and we didn't understand why as coaches. I actually prefer like I like the I get the point of the gator if you're a player and like you can bring it up and take it down. As a coach, I kind of preferred the mask because it just didn't like choke you on your face. So um, I think there, and you didn't have to worry, you know, with it being on your ears and stuff. So I think there was good and bad of gators. <laughs> oh no, I agree. I I would rather have the mask. But as a the, the defiant in me to our governor, I was like, why do we have, like, what is this? This makes no sense. So as the defiant in me, I was like, this is stupid. It makes no sense. Now me, I just had the normal mask. Yeah. Um, the school would provide like the disposable ones. So I didn't have to buy them anymore. Um, but, it, I, but we had the ones over the face shield for the players. That's okay. the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> because it would scrumble up to like here. And nothing's underneath. And so for me, I laughed because this makes no sense. But we can play, so I was going to let it go. But from the scientific standpoint of, like, the virus, I was like, this makes no sense of why this is a thing. And then halfway through the year, some had none on their face mask. And it just got let go. Yeah, no one, no one said anything. No, in basketball, they had to wear them the whole time. No jump ball. That was the dumbest rule I've ever seen was no jump ball. <laughs> you could you could steal the ball, but you couldn't do a jump ball. Yeah, it, you you could guard a guy. You could be right on him, but you couldn't do a jump ball. What did they uh, do, a, a coin flip for who got possession first? or A away team got the ball first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that was pretty dumb. And then some refs let it go because naturally when you run, it's going to fall. Yeah. We had refs that would literally, they're, in the rules, it said, do not stop play, like, if it's going. Mm -hmm. Like, if there's no situation, like, if somebody made a basket, you could stop. But if it's just going back and forth, you can't stop the game to make them put it back up. You can say it, but you can't stop play. There was refs that would stop the play and stand there and wait for you to put them up or kick them out of the game. And I'm like, you can't, these refs were god awful but i can't be mad because we have a shortage in illinois like we don't have refs it's bad I, i'm sure indiana is better but illinois just who just wants knows. to be one like there you, you're never going to be right everyone hates you we had a ref that looked like joe biden out there trying to run up and down and it was real funny but that's where we're at we were we were getting 78 year old refs and, like, we had a Thursday football game this year because of refs. Like, now that's strange. You want to talk about strange, like, to have a Thursday high school football game? The only good part of it was that Friday you did nothing. Yeah. You get a live scout. We couldn't. You can't go. There was places where you couldn't go. Um, yeah. But you had YouTube up. You had the YouTube thing pulled up. That was probably the probably the best thing that came of it is schools that didn't have the ability to 
live stream, figure that out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, cause then huddle, I don't know if you guys have it. I saw it for the first time at Burlington central for basketball. There's like a huddle TV Yep. and it just automatically moves with it. Yep. And then schools were using that for their huddle sideline cause it automatically went to the iPad. So we finally bought it. Addison's going to get it for next year. But a lot of schools got that. So I think Huddle made a lot of money with that. Uh, Burlington Central had it on their football field and on the basketball court. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty expensive. Too. Well, not that. I mean, it's nice because you don't have to worry about someone doing it if it works. Right. Because Huddle, though – they came out with a deal because Huddle was kind of smart with this. They said, okay, we'll sell this and have every sport in your school use it for like $2,000 less than what it would have been. Yeah. Like, yeah like they were football. saying if, if every sport had Huddle, we'll give you this for free. Because like football, I think, is the most expensive one. So it's like, I don't know, six to $8,000. It's ridiculous. I guess Huddle said, we'll give you – Everything and this TV, if every sport's going to use it for $8,000. So they get it. Originally, our district said no. And then as the season was progressing, we were trying to show them how easy this could be. And they said, oh, this makes sense. And went <laughs> to buy it. And then we're trying to get a TV on the sideline because you had Glombard Wests of the world and Willowbrooks of the world having this TV on the sideline with Huddle Sideline. And people are like, what's that? And we're like, oh, you can rewatch the play. Huge advantage, I think, for a school that's got it and a school that doesn't, and you know, in a game. We had it, but we just had the iPad. Yeah. Um. And the times, uh, you remember this when we played and when we started coaching, there was no huddle sideline in high school, so you had to rely on the players. You, I don't think you guys use huddle sideline, but you guys have to rely on the players to say, "What are you guys seeing? What are you seeing now in yeah. high school?" High school kids will bullshit you. If they come over to the sideline and I say, why did that guy flitz in the A-gap and you didn't touch him? Oh, he didn't do that. Or like, no, he wasn't there. Huddle sideline. But when it didn't work, they would bullshit me. Yeah. When it, no, I mean, they, you got kids with 30 ACTs that all say, hey, to the guard pull. Whether they knew, you know, were, were lying to me or not, I, didn't, I don't remember a guard pulling coach. And then you watch on Sunday morning, oh, yeah, the guard pulled there. <laughs> And they're just like, yeah, I spaced out, coach. <laughs> like, I wish they would just say that when they came to the sideline. I'd rather them say, yes, I screwed up, than like, no, it didn't happen. Because they knew when my whole sideline wasn't working. If I didn't have the <laughs> iPad, they would immediately tell me something. And I'd go watch it the next morning. I'm like, oh, remember when you said there was no blitzing A-gap guy on power or whatever? Or for defense when they would tell us, like, oh, that wasn't my guy that went deep. And they watch it. <laughs> Because we switched to a four-two-five, and so I, this didn't happen. They're like, "Oh, it's right there." But when it was working, they'd come over and be like, "Yeah, I know." I'm like, "It's right here." Yeah. So then I, I, I would start to think to myself, "Did we do that as players in high school? Did we bullshit?" I'm sure we did. I'm, I'm sure. Like, no one wants to be, especially when you're like, you think the negative is, "Well, I'm going to get benched if they find out I didn't do it right." Like, it's natural. Uh, but I think there's some of it too. Like the kid, some kids just aren't tuned in. Like they're out there, see ball, get ball, or hey, I'm an alignment. I'm supposed to, you know, I'm just going to try to go bury someone, and you know, I'm not seeing the linebackers. So I think there there is some of both kids lying, and then there's some kids that I just they're out there and they get the heat of the moment, they do whatever. Halsey wouldn't bench you. That would never happen. That's all I'll say about Charleston, I guess. They did really good this year, though. They had a nice season, yes. They did. And Lincoln's going back to the upstate eight, or uh, back to Rochester. Wow. Travel purposes. It's not to win more games, I wouldn't. <laughs> well, it's a two and a half hour drive to Lincoln from Charleston. Central State A, that's a tough conference. There's not many easy games there. Um, I know I'm wasting your time. I told you this is off the cuff. So, I was going to ask you this. Why in the world are all defensive guys running your type of stuff? I saw more 
three, 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 five, two, this, whatever defense I ever have this year in my life. Like we talk about Glenbard West, they've done it for years, but they did it. Then we had that week one, week two, we had a four, two, five, which is my perfect defense to coach against. Three weeks in a row after that, it was three, 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 five, two, whatever, two, five, two, six, whatever it was. Would you stop helping defenses do that to me with these four eyes and moving things around? And no, I mean I think uh, people have realized, um, and why why we do it is, is really a personnel issue. Like when we're recruiting a kid that's six three, two hundred and sixty pounds, he can be an offensive lineman, um, and you recruit five of those kids. And those can be your starting offense alignment, the kids that are athletic. Obviously, you guys are at high school, so you're not recruiting. But, you know, you can play with some smaller bodies. And then it makes your offensive line better because you're not stealing if you're a platoon team. If you're playing both ways, then still you're, you're, you're still resting an offense alignment that may have had to start in a four-down front, um, two guys. And then kind of what obviously we do is – we make that hybrid linebacker learn D line so we can still play four down fronts. But I think that's the easiest thing is defenses are realizing offenses are way better and they're going to find an answer, especially with huddle sideline. Like you're going to be able, if you sit in a four, two, five and put your three technique to the tailback and you play one coverage the whole entire game, you better be the best team and you better have the best 11 out on the field. Otherwise, the offensive guys are going to get there, especially in a high school setting where you got no huddle sidelines. So I think it is very easy now to get in a three down front and bring guys from different angles. And you may only have four different blitzes, but that presents four different things to an offense and you're rolling different coverages and different things. So I think it's uh, here to stay. I think maybe it was a COVID thing too. Hey, you know, with COVID, we're only six deep with D linemen. Um, let's go to a three man structure this year. That was one team in our league. That's why they were a four, two, five quarters team and they scrapped it and went to three, four because they felt that was best for COVID personnel and, and what they had recruited. Yeah. Cause I coached a three, four and the stigma was you need a big nose guard. Like that zero tech has to be big and mean and take on double teams. Do you think people have said, no, you don't need that. You can have a fast guy there now. Like, and that's why they're going to it. Yeah. I think they just realize it's like saying O line to block zone. You got to have road graders, you know, you gotta, you gotta have the best five blockers on your team and you can do whatever you want. If you coach it up and you can, you can teach it. Um, yeah. You don't have to have this. A lot of people are using this lag technique where you strike the, the center and let the center win, and you, you work on the backside. Well, in some ways, that's a lot easier for a guy that's quick off the ball um, that may not be the most powerful guy. Um, but, yeah, you can get by with undersized guys. Now, if you got a 6'4", if you got three guys that are 6'4", 260 pounds that can are playing Division One football, that makes things really easy on your linebackers, and you can be pretty stagnant. But if you got some quick guys, then you can slant and move and get different angles. Um I think it's it's the best thing about it is you, you're changing the picture. You could right. play base defense, but there's four different versions if you're a 3-4. If you're a 3-3 three, three stack or a 3-5, you know, just bringing one guy and one gaps, all something different the offense has to prepare for, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. Oh, yeah, it is. Trust me. Now, <laughs> it's really weird. I'm going to talk about it from an offensive standpoint. When I see a 3-4 or a 3-5 or a 3-3, I actually like it at first when you're drawing it up. When I'm drawing on the scouting thing, I'm like, look, we can run ISO. We can do inside zone. You might know you can run trap against it. But then when you actually go out there and they start moving, it's the ones that move. I think you guys move. That's what frustrates offenses. And for us, I don't know if you guys do this, we would get the four eyes. We would get a zero and two three techs. And then nobody to the outside, they would come at the, the still their five techs and it would confuse my linemen of like, well, where am I supposed to go? And then it was, it was no big tackles. It was a five foot 11, 190 pound kid, but they would slant all the time. Yep. 
So I'm like, maybe that stigma is gone that you don't need these big defensive linemen anymore if they can slant and move. Yeah, no, I think it's about creating you know, mass chaos and confusion where if you're undersized and outgunned, like you can move. Um, and I think some something's good to be said about if you're an offense and you're like, okay, we think they're going to play 4-I, 0-4-I, but they're only going to do it 20% of the time. But you're going in that game plan being like, this is our 4-I run. We're going to run this. Well, 80% of the time, they're not going to be in 4-I. So are you – is that run going to be good when they're in five techniques or four techniques or when they're in bear? Like you as an offense, I think it's evolving to you need to run plays that is going to be good against what they're going to be in a huge chunk of it. And if you're looking at your scouting report and you're like, there's a lot, then you shouldn't have like a four eye beater. You should, Hey zone. And this is good for all this junk that we're going to see Or Hey, if we run pin and pull, this is going to be good, but it's not going to only be good for four eyes because a team can get you in four eyes and stun outside very easily. And now they got a TFL because you ran a bad play. Right. Cause we did ISO and how I combated a four eye was a fold guard would go out and we bring the tackle underneath. But if you got a fast nose guard that beats my center, yep. that's what scared me. Because you freaking defensive coordinators are really smart and can move guys. Because I was just the run game coordinator, so the run game was on me. So when I saw that, I was, Steve, how do we beat that? I'm like, well, don't run ISO. <laughs> yeah. I, and as soon as, you know, I, I start seeing ISO and say we were a four-down team or a three-down team and we weren't moving, as soon as I know a team's running ISO on me, and they're kicking the crap out of my linebacker. Well, now all we need to do is move really one guy, and it can throw the whole playoff and really mess up three guys' blockings by just moving one or, or two guys. Because I just um, – there's a guy named Coach Mallard who does his YouTube thing. It's like Chalk Wars. I just did it a couple weeks ago with the coach at uh, Bluffin University in Ohio. Coach Ronda? Yeah, it was me and him. Yeah. So it was real funny. They asked me to do it, to do offense. I said, Sure. <laughs> The day of, he goes, oh, you're going against this guy. And I was like, I'm going against a college defensive coordinator. Are you shitting me? That runs three high defense. Yeah. Four eyes. Yeah. It hasn't come out yet, but I'll give a sneak peek. My very first play was quarterback ISO. And he goes, Steve, are you kidding me? He goes, I hate quarterback ISO. And I said, that's what we did this year. We had a running quarterback. Thank God it no, wasn't it's... you. I would have lost. I was like, please don't. Because he said, like, you're going to go against a college defense corner. I was like, if it's Nick, I'm going to lose it because that was tough. No, that's it's really hard. And I hate those things because, like, there's things that, like, we've had a lot of success doing. And the offense, you know, draws their plays. You draw what you think you've done well and been effective. And then, you know, people vote on it or however it goes. And, Usually it's like, oh, well, the offense had out, you know, defense had outside leverage and the offensive guy ran a slant, and got, you know, a guy completed first down. I'm like, I can count on my hand the number of times a slant has been caught on us in this situation. But OK, you did well. Like um, those are no fun usually for the defensive guys. Well, it's no fun for me because I'm like, this is a defensive coordinator in college and I'm I only know offensive line. And like, this is what I have to do. I've coached at Charleston High School, for God's sake. Like, this is all I do. This is all I know. It gets you sharp, though, and makes you think, like, okay, you know, especially because you, you see different things. Like, I, I did one of those, and I went up against a, a 12 personnel coach, and we don't see a lot of that stuff. And that was throwing RPOs, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I don't see that stuff. But, you, you know, you only know what you see, and you, you only coach against that stuff. So it's good to broaden your horizon. Yeah, it hasn't come out yet, but I think I lost. Looking back at it, I think I lost. But it's okay. You grow. You learn more from losing than what you do from winning. And what was embarrassing was, and it's another sneak peek, the situation was like fourth and 15 or, or fourth down, you're on the 10 to win the game. We had to do that the very last play of the game this year to win a game. So he's like, draw what you guys ran. I'm like, fuck. I don't remember. I knew we ran a play action power. I just didn't remember which pass play it was. So it was embarrassing. I was like, oh, I was in this situation. I don't remember. <laughs> last game, last play of the year, and we won on a RPO. 
So it was kind of embarrassing. You just throw it to your best player in that situation, right? Well, we just had to get to the end zone. So we just called a play where every receiver went in the end zone and <laughs> the pocket broke down. A quarterback scrambled. He sidearmed it. Everybody flew to it. The whole defense flowed with the quarterback. He sidearmed it. We had a guy in the end zone. I'm like, he's going to drop it. He's going to drop it. Caught it like a punt. Like he catch a punt. He caught it like this and just hugged it and fell to the ground. And we won the game. We never led in the game at all until then. That's it was awesome. a – what was it? I think we were losing 47-44. That's what it was. Big defensive battle. It was a huge defensive battle. <laughs> I loved it as an offensive person. We, yeah. we ran inside zone and scored a 65-yard touchdown run. That's always And it fun. looked like duo. It looked like duo. <laughs> I just want everyone to know that. Double teams everywhere. And guess what? It wasn't a three-man defense. It was a four-man defense. There you go. Uh, and it's a place where our headsets didn't work because right behind the stadium – was all the restaurants and stuff, so the headsets would go into the drive through <laughs> So they didn't work. So we're all on the sideline. Now, they had headsets that worked, but we didn't. Who, who was it that Charleston played that they would do that with? I don't know. Because uh, Coach Wolf always liked to tell me that. Old Carl would tell me. Maybe it was Mount Vernon. He said there was some place where they went and they had the headsets in the box. All of a sudden they hear, oh, that'll be 825 because they're picking up the drive through on their those wireless headsets. I know Taylorville was close to Sonic, so maybe it was Taylorville. Maybe. I don't remember. Because Carl has stories beyond stories, so I can't remember. But yeah, that's what happened. Um, then they just hired a new defensive coordinator. I know who he is. So he's like, we can't talk anymore. <laughs> um. so with COVID did you do what we did like this year we got crazy at first we wanted to do things we never would have done before defensively were you able to do anything like it's COVID year I want to try this Um. well I think you know whatever you got 15 months of nothing going on especially you, your situation of mine being in Illinois high school football and in division three we we're playing in the spring so I had so much time so much time and I'm like oh yeah that's easy and you, you realize like oh yeah yes that is easy for you that may be easy for your assistants on the staff but is that easy for the kids um, but uh, we were probably able to do more than we had ever done uh, the, the fall practices are, were actually really cool, um, and uh, we didn't have to play a ton of young kids, but I think if we had to play a bunch of young kids, we would have got them ready a lot easier because we were getting, I think we practiced like 20 times in the fall. But uh, we were able to do a little bit more than I think we normally would have done, but I think that just becomes – I think that came from me finding easy ways to teach it. It wasn't very difficult – um, again, our kids are smart, but I try to package things for that they are a dumb kid that scored a 12 ACT. I try to make it super simple. And it's, hey, this is the same as for you 10 guys, but this 11th guy has something different. So everything we do is kind of built on that structure. If it's like five of these guys, it's the same thing, but six of you guys, you're completely different, then we won't run it or we'll try to figure out a better way to teach or something. So um, I think I became a better teacher with COVID because we had more volume in our playbook. And I tried to figure out ways that made it easier for our kids to uh, understand everything we want to do. Yeah, we were brand new and everything. Now, I don't know if you probably didn't have the situation I did. I got away from drills and got more into scheme. Because for us, I hadn't seen the kids. I saw them in February a little bit. I hadn't seen them since October. So I got into scheme. I panicked. And I was like, they have to know the scheme of power. They have to know the scheme of inside zone. And they have to know this. And I got away from drills. Did you guys catch yourself doing that? Or since you're college, it was a little different? Um, I'm not a huge drill guy. Um, 
for like we technique. Tried to do... I got away from technique actually. Like okay. that's where I kind of got away from. I was so worried. I don't mean to interrupt you. I got so worried about the overall picture. And then I started to realize, like, Steve, you're getting away, you're you're sacrificing technique to make sure they understand this run play. I don't know if you guys did that or not. So we only get about uh Obviously, we had like a fall camp deal um, that was, you know, kind of a spring ball-ish deal. Um, we get about 15, 20 minutes of Indy um, a day in a normal practice. And then everything else is group work, um, teamwork, scout periods and all that stuff. So we don't have a huge period for um, technique stuff outside of those first few weeks. But I think on the defensive the way – you know, I try to structure it is block, you know, defeating blocks, block destruction. There's, you know, there's only a few ways you can do those things. So we'll work one of those every single day. Um, we have a big three circuit and it's the three big things we think will help us win football games. It's tackling, it's uh, takeaways, and it is technique. So every single day, one coach was teaching a different tackle drill to the different positions. Every single day we were doing some sort of takeaway drill every single day, a technique. And that's something that I would think you could do on the offensive side of the ball. Like you have a blocking, you have a catching, you have a ball secure, you know, whatever it being, obviously the old linemen don't need to go over to the, the catching. Um, but they, they may need to know how to ball secure, um, uh, because they may pick up a fumble. Um, there's certain things that I think you can do on an offensive circuit structure where you're teaching all your guys kind of the fundamentals of the game. Because um, if you're the O-line guy, there's probably something you could teach the running back, the receiver and blocking that's going to help them that they may not necessarily be getting from their position coach because they're focused on running routes and, you know, power left and the read spot and all that sort of stuff. So um, that's one thing we've done to always make sure we're getting – technical work in every day is have a technical circuit. Um, but everything we want to do drill wise, and we're at a college, so we can get a lot of this film, but go be a game like situation, film it, and then let's watch it with the kids or let's screen record it and send it out to the kids. So um, we try to get as much on, on film as possible to work with those guys. But uh, we have a limited number. Uh, we, we only practice for about an hour and 45 minutes each day. So you're taking that Mike Leach approach. Very short practice. Yeah, well, yeah, because we are spread, up-tempo, like everything super quick. Um, our, the whole goal is to, if we're going to meet and practice, that we're under two and a half hours. And because our kids' time is valuable. They're, they're – you know, the only reason they're here is to study engineering and it's hard and they need a lot of time to do all their classwork. So, uh, yeah, we're very quick in everything we do. And, yeah, we want to record it and we want everything to be at full speed. And that's kind of the expectation of our program. We don't do necessarily walkthroughs. Everything's at a, a jog through tempo if there is any sort of walkthrough scenario. Um, and we're trying to get a ton of reps. You probably kind of answered it. You're not big in drills. You want group. You want this big group. That matters more to you than anything. Yeah, I think to me, I think to only get better at football is you need to play 11-on-11 11 11 football. Um, inside runs great, and I think there's a time and a place for it. But as a defensive coach, if I'm going to play cover two, inside run does nothing for me because I need my corners there. Um, they need to be able to fit ISO and fit all these other plays that – they're not going to see, um, you know, so I, I love a team run period. I love a team pass. Seven on seven is great. But as an offensive coach, your quarterback's not feeling that pressure. Um, I can show you clips of awesome quarterbacks in seven on seven, and they go out to team pass and they kind of crap their pants a little bit. Or um, the O-line, like one-on-one -on -one pass pro, that's awesome. But I like five on four or five on three, like, there is a time and place for all these segmented drills, and maybe you start there, but the game of football is on 11-on-11 11 11 or, you know, 5-on-4 pass rush. Like, your kids only to get better at that need to play as much football as possible. I agree. I don't like – offensive line perspective, one-on-one -on -one makes no sense to me because what's that – from a defensive end perspective, what are you going to do? You're going to do something you're not taught to do. Yeah. 
because you want to win that one-on-one. -on -one. There's that video going around Twitter. I'm sure you've seen it, where that offensive lineman, there's no pads, and he just throws him. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my God. And I'm like, holding. <laughs> you threw him, and that's not what's going to happen. Well, and you can teach your scheme within your drill. So, hey, guys, we're – slide protection left or man side on the right okay next rep we're opposite so not only are you getting good fundamental work if you can film it or you can coach it on the fly but you're teaching the scheme and using technique in a smaller setting so then you obviously you go from the the five on four pass rush into a team pass and you're building it you know building it up and, and I, I just am a huge fan of playing football because we one year we looked, we did inside run, and we were awesome against power and inside run and counter and inside zone, but we got in a game where it was 50-50 whether they are going to run and pass and our kids were hesitant. Well, they never practiced against getting power one play and quick game the next. It was always power, 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 counter, inside zone. So your kids start to play the drill. Now, we don't tell our kids when we do team run that it's team run, and we don't tell them when we do team pass that it's team pass. We say, hey, it's team, but the coaches kind of script that way, and it's an understanding. Hey, and team run, we'll probably have four runs, maybe a shot, maybe a perimeter screen, and team pass, we're going to have some draws. You know, we'll probably have an inside run. Um, but, you know, the kids don't know that, but the coaching staff does. And that way, as a coach, you know, you're putting your best run – defenses and then your best pass defenses and then there's periods where we'll say hey let's play the ball as it lies i don't think enough teams do that within practice where hey balls on because everything's scripted and scripting's awesome but for you for me any guy calling the play if you don't play it as it lies in practice friday night and saturday afternoon is the first time all week you're going to do that it's hard to flip that switch um mm -hmm. So I think, you know, being able to play the football as it lies is, is huge, too. And um, one thing that I would like to do if I'm a head coach is, and, I, and I've heard other people talk about this, but within practice, if you have your one offense go against your two defense, um, your one plays the ball as it lies, and then, okay, it's they score a touchdown. Well, then you go kick the extra point, and then you bring in the two offense versus your one defense. Because so many times that one offense and that one defense, they hate each other, right? Well, they need to work together because on Friday night and Saturday afternoons, they're working together. So the one offense needs to know when the defense goes three and out and there's a bad punt and they have a short field like, hey, thanks, defense. We scored, but you put us in a good situation or vice versa. The offense drove all the way down the field and scored. Um, and the starting offense gets the ball back out on the 20 yard line. Well, yeah, I think that helps. And then at the end of the day, your reps are based on what's realistic in a game. You're going to go on a 10 play drive. It's going to take five minutes. And now the defense is out in the field. And if they go three and out, you have a short break as an offense. So now as an offensive coach, do you really want to tempo? this next drive you want to huddle up and, and take time because your guys were just out on the field for six minutes they're tired on the sideline so I think there's some of that that you can get better Monday through Thursday so you can be uh, your best on Friday or Saturday the coach Steve show is sponsored by the launchpad kickoff tee if you're a football coach out there high school college NFL doesn't matter and you're looking for that edge for your special teams for your kicker for the kickoff on sides you guys need to go to launchpadkickofftee.com. If you have a younger guy trying to develop the kicker, you want the ball to get to the end zone, you need to go to Launchpad Kickoff Tee. This tee gives a coach a strategic options for squib kicks, onsides, everything. It is proven that your kicker will kick off farther. It is legal for NCAA, for high school. Okay, The Launchpad Kickoff Tee is a game changer. So if you go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS to use the code CSS, you can get a Launchpad Kickoff Tee for 10% off. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS. You can use the code CSS for the Coach Steve Show to get 10% off. Also, there's a bundle. You can get one for 10% off. You can go to two, 
and get more percent off. Or there's an option to buy four. If you click the option to buy the four kickoff tees, if you like it so much, when you use the code CSS, you'll get the fourth one free. So instead of paying full price for all four, you'll get three. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS. Use the code CSS. Get 10% off. Buy four to get the fourth one free. This is a game changer, guys. It does more than just hold your balls. Go get the Launchpad Kickoff Tee today to give your kicker an edge for next season. As you guys know, the Coach Steve Show is also brought to you by the Unhinged Sports Network. The Unhinged Sports Network is a 24-hour, seven days a week, nonstop playing uh, radio podcast about any sport that you guys can imagine. They have a proud partnership with Fanatics. So if you go to the link in the description, uh, go to Fanatics, use that link, and go get some gear to support the Coach Steve Show and to support the Unhinged Sports Network. They have deals all the way up to 70% off. They have deals for free shipping. And they have every single sports team you could think of. Your college team is going to be on there. Your professional team is going to be on there. They have good deals on jerseys, T-shirts, hats, socks, anything you want. So please use the link in the description to go to fanatics.com. Save big on your team's gear to help support the unhinged, support the Unhinged Sports Network and to support the Coach Steve Show. That's a good point. You know who does that? Derek, Coach Leonard at Rochester. That's what they do. They won a lot of state championships. They have really good football players, but they are well coached, and I think they have a great philosophy of what they do. It was funny as you're saying that I'm picturing him telling how they're practice him and him and Steve over there telling me how their practice is going. That's what it looks like. It's real funny. I don't think I don't think we do that enough, coaches. We don't do that enough. Because as a coach, you have to get better. If you expect to be the best coach you can possibly be, and you're only practicing that aspect of being a great coach ten times a year. That's not enough. Like you have a ton of opportunities through a summer and a fall to get better. Yeah, when I was at Lombard East, we did drills during the summer. So the stepping over bags and all that stuff, that's summer stuff. When we got to August, it was done with that. It was group, what you're talking about. Yeah. Now this COVID year, we didn't get that. So we had to cram, I don't know. July or August through like we had to cram four or five months into two months and it was awful. And we're coming right back to it next week. Like there's, we're coming right back. Now I know we were talking about this off air, but do you guys practice the, the huddle sideline aspect you, you know, in your practice or are your guys, I'm sorry to put you on a spot, are your guys figuring that out for the first time on that first Friday night? Like kind of that ap- aspiration or that, I guess, how that whole operation works. I'm going to answer it two different ways. Okay. Glumbard East we did Okay. because we had the drone. We had the drone filming it and we it could be sent directly. So if we wanted to look at it, we could. When I was at East Aurora, we didn't get huddle sideline. So there was no practice with it. Here, we had a lot of technical problems. We tried. We really tried. But here's the funny thing. Where my school now is located, I don't know if you've ever been to Addison's High School. It's very close to O'Hare. You can see the airplanes taking off. So I guess we're not allowed to have a drone because of that. But we tried. We tried. But we had a lot of technical problems. So I, that's not the answer you're looking for, but we did. Yeah. We It was in our plans where, okay, during today's defensive team time, we're going to have huddle sideline out so we can see. And something would happen. Our camera wouldn't work. The huddle sideline wouldn't log in. Something would happen, but at least we tried. But that's a good point you brought up where we had a couple coaches this year not know what that was. Now, not to brag about me, I knew because yeah. I've been doing it 12, 13 years. Like, I knew what it was. I knew how to look at it. But, again, I'm not going to tell my own problems. Sometimes it's just me and the offensive coordinator in a meeting. Yeah. So, when it's just us two, we knew what to look at. But you got volunteers. You have this. You can't expect them to do, hey, stay for a half hour after practice for a meeting. Like, you can't ask a guy not getting paid to do that. You know, and maybe some people hated that I was brand new and I got paid. I don't know, but I did. I stayed after because that's what they're paying me for. Yeah. But that is a good point of 
do people not use huddle sideline? Do we know how everything's going to hook up? Do we know what we're looking for? We tried. Glenbard East, we knew. we Like, you're looking at this, you're looking at this, and we just go. Um, I heard someone makes a, uh, like, a, a stick that you can mount your drones on if you're in a situation where you can't use the drone um, because of the airport. First of all, Chicago suburbs suck with their rules. I'm used to country where we do what we want. <laughs> um, but we were just going to do, we had an injury. So we had a kid, we had this platform they could stand on. Um, or we were going to go to the game field. So like if we were going to do our teams, because we have a practice field, which is turf, which is pretty nice. If we couldn't be down there, we would try to go to the game field and they can go up in the box. But with COVID, you had soccer going on at the exact same time. Soft, our football field is connected to the softball field if they needed to practice. So it was just a whole thing. So for the summer and the fall, to answer your question, we are going to do that. We already talked about it. Where we got brand new equipment. Where we, got a, we got brand new huddle sideline. They sent it to us. We are going to do that. Because I brought that up. We had an end of the year meeting and I brought that up. I said we need we need to be able to know how a game's going to look like. We need to be able to know situations. We have to be able to – what coach is going to do what? Because I'm sure for you as the defense corner, like you're going to look at specific things, but you want someone else to, hey, what is this? You have to look at this for me. I can't see it yep. all. Yeah, no, everyone's got a role. And I just – I find that interesting. Obviously, at the college level, we, we can't do that. But we, we actually – worked on that this f fall um, because every, you know, when, when stuff was scripted, you know, we run through our six plays and I'd bring the starting defense over after that series and the two would go out and then we'd have the young, you know, young coach signal for the twos. And I went through, I said, okay, on the first play of the drive, it was inside zone. Um, hey, you were the, you know, three tech or the five technique over there being red. What did you do? Okay. Hey, play two was play action pass. All right. I saw it got completed over there to the flat. Hey, flat guy, did you see that? Yeah, coach, I messed up. So we kind of went through a drive. Now it obviously helped that I had things scripted versus me physically trying to figure out in the six plays what the offense had had done. But sometimes we did that. Like we played it like a glide and then, you know, I quickly scribbled down on my sheet of paper. OK, that was a uh, inside zone. That was outside zone. OK, that was quick game. That was drop back. So. Then we bring those kids over why it was fresh in their mind and worked on that thing. Obviously, if you have huddle sideline, then you're able to, hey, who's got the iPad? Great, guys. This is that. Okay, great. Now go watch. Um, so, obviously, you're practicing that sideline mechanic Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So, when Friday comes around, and I know we talked about this off air, like that kid lying about things and, and mm -hmm. different things on, on Friday and Saturday um, afternoons. Well, they're just, I think they're afraid of giving the answer. Like, did I really screw up? But I try to tell them, I'm an asshole, but I'm not that big. If I'm asking you, I just want you to tell me so I can fix it. When I find out on Saturday morning, because they don't think I'm going to remember, like, hey, remember I asked you about this? There it is. Or like the best one was I had a kid hold on a screen and it was a 50-yard touchdown, but it got called back. I didn't hold him. And I didn't have hollow silence because it wasn't working. Saturday morning, I'm like, oh, look, there it is. <laughs> like, there it is. Um, are you guys allowed to, like, unpractice anyway? You don't have a whole sideline, but is it, do you have to scribble it, or can you watch it directly and practice at least to make it more We, we have huddle sideline for uh, – we can't use it in the game, but we do have a huddle sideline just to make it more efficient in terms of intercutting the practice. Okay. Um, uh our conference doesn't allow it, but certain conferences, like the ejection college rule, you could go to the huddle sideline um, to go for to see if that was a helmet to helmet ejection for that stuff. So yeah, we have it recorded and it goes straight to the iPad. Um, now this year we got into the drone world, so uh, we were doing some different things with the drones as well. And, and in fact, you know this, like we're we're used to being you know at our place a, a sideline and an end zone shot for both teams so that's four cameras being able to just have two guys work a drone so much more efficient you, less bodies that you actually need and um the less you know less that you actually need both guys to get both shots of the sideline in the end zone like a drone 
he's either, you know, it, it's nerve wracking. He's either going to get it or he doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully he gets it. Hopefully he's recording during the play, not during <laughs> the after the play. Everyone's been there and they watch 30 minutes of after the play. Um, but uh, luckily uh, we're out of school with some smart kids. But you'd be surprised uh, kids not figuring out when something's recorded and, and uh, when it's uh, his recording. Yeah, that drone view is a game changer in practice. That we had that at Glenbard East, and I was like, oh my God. Like you can see everything. Yeah. Especially when it's like right above, you can just see it. Yep. And he had it on his phone. It got sent to an iPad. You could look at it right then and there, and it uploaded it right to Huddle when it was done. So when practice was over, we could walk right up there and watch it. It was done. No, it's nice. Um, I, I'd say the one negative thing is the battery life, but again, yep. um, you can buy better batteries. <laughs> better bat. I mean, if that's all you have to buy, it's not that bad. Like we're investing in this drone. Every so often, we go buy batteries. Um. Uh. Again, I tried at Charleston because Royal King was right across the street, and I was like, "They sell drones, and they'll donate batteries." Up here, there's plenty of places that would donate. Like, oh, we'll give you batteries. Yeah. Just, just put our business logo on the fence. Yep. Uh, now, I wonder in how long it's going to be when they actually let them fly on the stadiums for games because that honestly would be make things so much easier if we could just put a drone. And we don't even need to necessarily fly it. We Again, we could have it our drone camera uh, like on a pole. We brought that up, but I know some people are worried about like filming to still signals or something. They're worried about that. Um, I know if you get the huddle camera that I was talking about earlier, um, if you just have that, and you don't need anybody operating it. You can still just operate the end zones. So you just need one person. Um, I don't know if they'll ever go to that for us for games anyway at the high school. But that, that that huddle thing was real cool because you had the camera on the field moving with it. And then you had the other camera just point at the scoreboard. Yep. Um, so when we saw like the YouTube videos or like that's how people sent their film. So on the film it had down and distance on the scoreboard yep. and it had this. And it was really nice to see um, that. So when we get that, that's going to save a lot where we don't have to do that. I'm sure the huddle assist people that do all that data were probably huge for the scoreboard shot. So they actually knew what down and because I'm sure yeah. people film it and the kids don't get the down markers like and your huddle, you're mad at huddle assist people like they didn't get the right down. And well, are the markers in the shot? Like, how do you expect them? There's no down. You know, I'm assuming for most high school games, there's not a detailed D and D um, play by play report. Um, even at the college level, it's not always right. Um, so I'm sure that's no fun for those people sitting there trying to figure out the down and distance. Or like when there's a penalty, if you're filming it, you stop when the play's over. So they they have to look at it like, was that a penalty? Why are they like? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten mad over bad to think like, do I want to do this? <laughs> no. No. Like our our last play that we won on. The guy filming, I can't blame him. As soon as the play was over, he stopped filming. But I wanted to see the reaction of like the game yeah. one, you know. But they they stopped filming. What if it was a penalty? Like I, we don't, we got to see it. Yeah. But again, if we get that, that's probably why they made that. You're right. That's probably why they made that. Like this helps us. But now you actually need a competent scoreboard keeper to put the actual down and distance. You're right. <laughs> If your GA ever walks in, tell him I said hi. I don't know who he is. Because okay. you need a GA still, right? Did you guys fill that? Um. Yeah, we we offered it out. We uh, hopefully the kid will take it. Oh, I'm not taking. I was just gonna promote it. Like, hey, he needs. No, it. no. We 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 should be pretty. Should be full. Um. I thought about it. I thought about it, but to uproot. And leave. Yeah. Well, it's hard. Like, uh, people ask me all the time. I'm like, you really want to leave your full-time teaching position um, to come be a, a college graduate assistant? Um, you know, it, that was my passion. and It was great. But I started off making nothing. So making nothing, going up to the next level to make nothing is way different than being a full-time teacher 
having a family, uh, rent, mortgage, dogs, vet bills we talked about, to, oh, you make 13 grand and you get school paid for. Um, it's just a, it's a huge thing. And it's a roll of the dice because you could do that and you could go coach division one, or you could do that and you could end up being back in high school in a few years. But you did it right away though. You didn't like. Yeah, it's way easier right away. Cause my first job was a GA. I made 3,500. I went from making zero as a college student to 3,500. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> then, then the next job was $12,000 intern job. You know, most of these jobs aren't glorious. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm making four times the amount of money. And then I got promoted within with, you know, with another role where I'd like doubled my salary. And I'm like, whoo, let's go. And then it's all downhill from there, you know, like, um, but no, it's, it's a lot easier. I would say when you're coming from nothing, then, Hey, I got this 40, $70,000 teaching job and I'm going to get rid of that to go make 12 grand and, and move to a different city. Not to deteriorate people, I make more doing three high school sports than that. Yep. Those jobs. Yeah, just just I, the state of the sports, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, just this, especially in the suburbs. Like the three combined is double or, or so than that. But yep, it's the suburbs again. At the end of the day, like if you're a good coach and you got some, you know, that, the connections, the big thing. Mm -hmm. All these high school guys that are Division One football coaches, they were, for the most part, at super successful high schools where these Division One coaches were coming in to recruit their players. For the most part, there, there's probably some outliers out there. Um, and, and they were winning state championships and setting a lot of records and all that, and they're going to get noticed. Um, but, you know, if you do a good job anywhere and you, you have some connections and you meet some people, like, there's good things are going to happen. Same with high school. That's how I got where I was. The big thing up here is North Central. Everybody and their mother went to North Central up here. <laughs> yeah. Like East Aurora's head coach, he's went there. The head coach over for now went there. Everybody at Burlington Central almost went there. Uh, it's crazy. That's that's what connects people up here in Naperville for some reason. Well, and then they go win a national title because all their, you know, alumni are successful high school coaches in the area that are, you know, going to push North Central a little bit more than what maybe they would a North Park to their kids. And coaches left there. Um, Brad Wilson, the OC at the University of Indianapolis, he, it was real funny. He coached there when I had him on here. He told me to go to Crosstown Wings, which is right down the street in Naperville, and I've never been there for the Wings. And he goes, wait, you've never been there? Get your ass out there. First time I went there, I had, after I had COVID, I had no taste. First time I went there. Did you eat the hot wings then with no taste? Yeah, I got the wings. I, I was like, maybe this will bring it back. And I took a bite of that. I could just tell that it was hot. hot. <laughs> um. I tried to learn to drink black coffee during that time because I couldn't taste. I could just feel the grittiness. Uh, we took a bite of an onion. Couldn't taste it. Uh, you could take jalapenos and put chocolate on them. You didn't know. Now, was the onion, did it make you cry? You know how no. onions will make you cry? Yeah, I, I didn't do that. No. Like, literally, when I say I tasted nothing, it was just nothing. And it was the weirdest experience because when you, when the, because you probably know when you lose your smell with COVID, it's because your nostrils are swollen shut. Yeah. So for us, it was like our nose was on fire. And how I knew that I lost my smell was I woke up with a dog panting in my face and I couldn't smell her breath. And I was like, something's not right. And I had COVID on the Super Bowl. So like, any food you we wanted, I was like, I can't, we can't taste it. I had it on my birthday and I, I oh. knew because uh, I got our favorite pizza place here in town. Oh. I'm like, I can't, this is actually not good. Like, no. Now, did you eat more? See, for so 
when I, I took the opportunity of like, maybe I'll eat less. But for me, it was nothing satisfied. So I just kept yeah. eating. Because you're curious of, well, maybe this will have a taste. Like, oh, yeah. I'll eat half a bag of uh, gummy worms or Sour Patch Kids. Maybe I'll taste it. And all you taste is the sugar. And you're like, oh, I just 2,000 calories of nothing. Awesome. Yeah, or like breakfast we're like oh i'm gonna have this pancake and syrup and butter well it didn't i couldn't taste it i'm like well what if i have a bagel too maybe that's gonna happen because for us it's nothing satisfied so for me and my brain i'm like i gotta eat this is not satisfying and then to take the dog outside i felt like i ran eight miles <laughs> and then my girlfriend had the body aches and pains so one day she slept for 17 hours <laughs> And when we got, I'm going off the thing, when I got contact traced from school, she goes, well, if, if you just were around somebody with COVID, it's a 14-day quarantine. With, with COVID, it's only 10 days, like, trying to be positive about it. And I'm like, or I could die. Like, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> and then they're like, don't sit down all the time because COVID can fill into your lungs that way. And I'm like, but when I walk around, I feel like I just ran the marathon. <laughs> and then the best part was, I said, what medicine can I take? Well, nothing's going to make it go away. And I said, I know that. I just want to get through this. But it's not going to make it go away. And I was like, okay. So I would take DayQuil like eight times a day. Yeah, it's just a waiting game. Oh, that was the worst. DayQuil would kick in, and I felt good for an hour. So during that hour... I did what I wanted. Then after that hour, it just it would sink back in. So I was like, what TV show can we binge watch today? <laughs> and when I got COVID, it was the first day of basketball practice. I hadn't gone to basketball practice yet. So I almost shut down the whole place the very first day. But then when after COVID, I was all confident. I'd go to basketball practice with the mask down. I'm like, I got the antibodies. I don't care no more. And then when you tell people you had COVID, they do this. They're like, what? Um, see, there's something I was going to ask you. I know you're like, Steve, this is the waste of my time. Um, I was going to ask you, so what's it like being big time? You're all over the place. You're doing podcasts, clinic, this, this, and that. You're big time from Chucktown. Um, not necessarily big time, but in, anybody asks me to do something, I'm willing to do it if, if I got some free time. So I've been blessed to meet a bunch of people um, and, and do some things like these, like this, and uh, I'm willing to do it. I just want to help, help, help out the profession. So I don't consider myself big time. A lot of people will call me spread defense like hey what's going on like uh, i i'm not big headed like i'm in, in fact embarrassed that somewhat like just call me nick like i'm not spread defense there's not a huge persona that i have like i just want to show people what you know good defense can be played um i i've came from no connections um i've learned pretty much everything that we do um from someone else and I'm willing to share it. So I don't consider myself big time, uh, but I get it all the time. Hey, spread defense, this, that, you know, I'm just Nick. Uh, I coach football and I'm willing to help out anyone out there. Well, if I was professional, I want you to present some for my podcast someday, but I wasn't professional enough at the time. I'm trying to get back into it. So hopefully before you get too busy, I get you back to present something. Okay. Now I've watched your stuff, but I need to like, want you to present it for me to ask questions. Yeah. Um, before you get too busy, you have to let me know when you get busy. Um, but I want people to know when you're big time, you got to bring me with, because I remember you coming to Charleston and watching me beat, watching slants thrown on Madden way back when. Like, <laughs> we got to remember. Yeah. I actually bragged about you one time to Banster. I was like, now hold on. You guys all know him now. I knew him years ago when I lived with his friend on 4th Street. So I bragged about it. I was like, now hold on a second. You guys know spread defense. I know who Coach Nick Davis is. Not, he's not good at Madden, can't, defe can't defend slant slants. Well, was it you or was it was it uh, old Sean? I can't I, Sean's way better at, at Madden than I ever 
I ever was. Um, my claim to fame was I was pretty good at NCAA 2012. <laughs> I had to dig that out. When I had COVID, I had bought, no, during quarantine, I bought um, a 360 from somebody for like 20 bucks so I could play that. So when I actually had COVID, that's what I did. I busted out 13 and 12 and played them. Yeah, I think 12 was my year. Um, I played like an online franchise because we were just getting out of college. I was a GA and me and Sean and 10 guys had a league. And uh, we were all in the SEC, and I had Auburn, and uh, the best guy in the uh, in the league had Kentucky. So I beat him three times for national title. He beat me three times, and uh, everyone was mad that I was a good player and I had had a good team. And at, at the end of the day, the guy was way better than me. He just had Kentucky, and I had Auburn. See, I can just be the Packers with Rodgers and throw slants. That's what it was. <laughs> See, it's coming back. It might have been you. I think you were kind of like, this is unrealistic, and I just laughed. I was like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I was probably playing a coverage that stops slants. And, oh, yeah, let me play uh, cover two and have the middle linebacker go to the slant, and the slant's just going behind the, the middle linebacker. But, see, slants beat cover two, though. That's how I was taught growing up. Depends. <laughs> if the, the zone player is watching the quarterback throw it, um, you got a good chance. Because, see, when I was younger, it was if we saw too high and we had a slant on one side, go look to the slant because it, it, you can get under, like, obviously you can stop. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of times when we, would, when we, yeah, when it was trips and you got the one high, it wasn't going to work. But if yep. we went two by two and you had the double slant, it, it might have been the second slant that was going to be open. Because he wanted to see what the backer yep. was going to do. Which one was he going to go to? Yep, and that's where being a 3-4 defense or a three-man defense, it's not a, hey, if it's A, it's B. It's a, oh, A, B, oh, there may be a C, D, because you can bring any of those four linebackers and replace it with any defensive back. So you can't necessarily be like, oh, it's one high, you got this. Well, you may have one high – and you go to throw it, and now there's a defensive back coming down to replace that linebacker that's coming. Well, then, like, for us, I would almost – I don't know if this combats that or you let me know. I'd say, okay, let's make it a spot route to where he's not fully going into the backer. It's more of a quick sit down. That was, like, the adjustment. No, I think there's there's merit to that. A lot of receivers coaches don't like um routes and i know a hitch isn't this way or a slant but a hitch is kind of this way like a, a route that dies like i go run my hitch and i turn back to the quarterback and then i'm done so a lot of receivers coaches are advocates for i run a route and then i'm either back down my stem or i'm flat in or out like to m make sure that they're always on the move so there's that group of receivers coaches and the coordinators that think in that uh, mindset, which I think is good and bad. Like as a defensive back and I, I see you break on a hitch, I'm coming down. I know you're not going to move. Um, I know where you're going, but if you break on a hitch and I come down and now you're moving from that hitch, whether it be back to the ball or um, in or out, now he's got to make another break. Well, like when I was studying air raid, um, coach Drew Piscopo, he's a high school coach. He was talking about mesh and like the traditional mesh, um, the outside receivers would run like posts. Yep. But he adjusted it to where they weren't speed outs, they were curl outs. The receivers never stopped. They just kind of curl yep. it out. Because from an offense, I don't know if you do this, when you see the wide receiver like beat the drum, you know, and they break down, stutter real quick and go, the corner can really bite on that because they're seeing yep. them stop. If they just keep going and the corner's dropping, if you're a one high and they're dropping, that's how they combat that. So, like, how would you read that if someone did that? Like, if they just kept going, if you're corners. Yeah, like, if you were playing a cover three, you're just going to have to tip your cap, and hopefully the underneath defender um, are doing that. If you're playing man and you're over the top, then there's some tool your, tools to your toolbox. Like, hopefully you're not way out of phase when that guy drops out, that you're in contact and you're able to uh, cheat. Uh, as a defensive back, imagine that where you can grab a hip and pull yourself back in 
um, in, in good phase. But yeah, I mean, there's certain things like we play cover three and you ran that route and that's going to get completed. Tip your hat and don't play cover three next time. <laughs> True. Um, in, in quarters, like your quarter safeties, you're going to be on top of number two most of the time. So you're going to have those read digs and stuff wide open. Like quarterback's got to throw it. The receiver's got to run the right route, catch it. Like it's awesome on paper. Uh-huh. Um, you got to execute it both ways. Um, if you're a defense and they're executing at a high level, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to give up 45 points if they're able to execute at a high rate. But like a lot of people are going to your defense because I blame you for this. So when I see it every week, I'm like, I'm blaming him. But I think what – I don't know if you started this, but I saw you do it first. Defenses are now almost out formationing offenses. They want to line up a certain way to make the offense think something different. Now, we all kind of did that, but back when we all played it was – Three four, you're gonna look like this the whole time. Four three, you're gonna look like this the whole time. Yeah, my whole goal is to ten times a game win just because of my call. Um, mm-hmm. versus just hey, I'm gonna put my three technique to the tight end. We're gonna play quarters coverage. And um, you know, I, I talk about it, it's it's like the, the civil war. You line up from each other and whoever's got the bigger guns wins. Well, offenses before defense have decided hey, let's have another tactic here. And I think the defenses are now catching up to it, being like, let's just not sit in the same thing and see if we have the bigger gun because offenses are coming out with all these different formations and all these different plays. And now the defense has to counter with, I have a different front, I have a different movement, I have a different coverage, and you need to pick right to beat me. And if you do, awesome. We'll rally to tackle. I hope you can execute. Um, but I'm never going to just sit there and I'm going to let you do whatever you want to one defense. Um, Cause at the end of the day, these offenses are too good. Um, now, if you're the best team on the field that day, you might be able to sit with your three technique to the tight end, play quarters coverage and get away with it. But at some day you're going to play a team that's better than you. But like what for us, what I saw was there's a lot of guys running the exact same coverage, but they would come out and lined up different. And yep. so they never changed their play call. They just had some verbiage or some signal of like, this is how they're going to line up. So if they're a cover three, but they came out in this two high or this four, and I think it looks like cover four. And then as soon as the ball snap, the safety's coming up to run in the box and they're back in their cover three. Well, yeah, I think it too, like defensive coaches are figuring out, I don't need to beat coach Steve. I need to beat coach Steve's quarterback. Mm-hmm. Coach Steve's going to be able to figure it out, and their staff's going to be able to. They're 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 got a bunch of good coaches. There's good coaches every week, you know, across you know on every staff. At least one, two, three. Some of these schools got 25 coaches. Um, but you don't need to beat Coach Steve. You got to beat Coach Steve's quarterback. And if you can get Coach Steve's quarterback, if he could beat you, if you can get to him and you get Coach Steve's backup quarterback in, well, you got a really good chance um, to, to go make some plays. So I think. Yeah, you, you don't need to fool the coordinator. You just got to fool the quarterback that's out there. And I think that's a lot easier than fooling a guy that watches eight hours of film, you know, of his opponent throughout one or two days. It doesn't take much to fool me, so that's not – that's why I don't call plays no more. I'm run game. I look at the box. Yeah, well, we just got to fool, fool your center then, right? Or whoever makes the call, like – at the end of the day, the same, same principle, like within the box, if you can get the center to identify the front wrong or then stem late and the offense line doesn't communicate, um, I think that's the beautiful thing is if you def- – offenses want to put the defense in conflict, I want to put the O-line in conflict with whatever we do, whether it's a movement, a front, a front to a movement, stemming, um, and like I said, if I can win 10 games that way or 10 plays in a game that way, I think that could be the difference. Oh, yeah, especially when you got a new O-line guy coming in who's an asshole. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what happens. Yeah, make that offensive line coach everything. That offensive line coach coach everything. Three down, four down. I'll stop talking. <laughs> I don't want you to um, – everyone do everything against you. But, yeah, make them – Teach their whole whole unit the playbook. That's kind of my philosophy. Well, that's why offenses have gotten so simple, where they mainly have three 
it's a weird thing in football. You see offenses may only have three run plays or four run plays because they want to be simple. But then yep. it helps out the defense because now you know, oh, it sucks because they do inside zone, outside zone, trap, and power. Yep. But you know that's all they're going to do. And then if you can figure out by formation, maybe they run four things. And on my end, if they only run power and outside zone with a tight end in the core, well, now you've eliminated two other possible things and you're only preparing against two plays. And when they're running trap and inside zone on the tight ends out of the core, you're not preparing for four, you're preparing for two based off of what the offense presented you. Right. So when offense has got simpler, defense has got a little simpler, I think. I think that's kind of what started you guys just out formationing the offense, outlining yeah. them up. Yep. And again, like we may not be simpler, but we're complex, but it's a simple skill. Like if you can figure out rules to make your three and your four down mesh as a defensive coach, that's going to make your life a lot easier. Now, does pistol piss you guys off? Because I just, the defensive coordinator that just got hired, who I know at a school, he, I don't want to put him on blast, but he's like messing with me. He was like, <laughs> Can you tell your OC not to do pistol next year? Like, no, like, it presents a different problem. Like, in the ideal world, if I was an offensive coordinator, I'm going to have shotgun. I'm going to have pistol. I'm going to be under center. Like, if you can teach it all, mm-hmm. and I think that's easy because you could teach under center and, and pistol, and obviously there's a five yards difference between your quarterback and certain things. But no, I think there there's merit to that, and it, you've figure out the defense. If they are hardcore, they're going to put their three technique to your running back. We'll put it in pistol. And there's teams that will put them in pistol and and late move them. Um, Because what you'll find if you're mostly pistol is you might run into a defense that plays double twos. Well, that may be a a booger as an offensive line coach to block double twos all game long um, because they can be a three and a shade based on what direction you're going. A lot of people lag that. So you as an offensive coordinator are trying to outsmart this defensive guy, and the defensive guy, in fact, gets you in a situation you're like, yeah, let's not be pistol because I don't want to deal with these double twos anymore. So I think you got to have the ability to do it, but you also need to be able to not do it if the defense has a game plan for your pistol. We did both. We, we did exactly that. We would offset, pistol. We did it all. We, we play a team at 11 personnel. They'll be pistol. 10 personnel, they'll be offset. And I find that's a nice little mat, you know, mix. They'll run inside zone out of shotgun, and they'll run inside down zone out of pistol. Out of pistol, they're more likely to cut it back. Out of shotgun, they're more likely to hit it to the, the side of the play. And then if you're looking at an inside zone tendency, it's about 50-50 whether it cuts it back or same side. But if you look at where it is in terms of where the running back is, whether he's sidecar or pistol, it's more of a 75-25%. Yeah, I like pistol. But then when you do pistol on an offensive standpoint, you cut off half the field if you're doing an RPO. Yeah. You really have to trust your high school quarterback to pre-snap. I'm going to throw it to that. It's, yeah, Blind throws aren't, aren't a winning business model. No, it's not. That's why we did both. We understood... Yeah. We understood if we were gonna do like ISO and we really want to get downhill, go pistol. But can we do other things out of it? We can. We wanted to run inside zone, we went offset. Your nakeds are better at a pistol. Um, your shot protections I th- or your shot plays are better at a pistol in my mind. Um, obviously your running back running a route, free releasing weighs better at a at a shotgun. Um, outside zone, depending on your team, like if your running back's fast. Maybe you need to slow them down because you're a line. Well, you should get in shotgun. If your running back's fast and that's a good thing, (laughs) get it to them in pistol. Like, um, I think it's a tool to your toolbox, and then you figure out what your kids are best, what your running back, your quarterback, um, and and your line. I think there's a lot of tools there. Because that happened. We were in pistol. We had, like you said, head up the guards the whole time. So to get them out of that, um, I tried to told them we would run dive like just triple team. 
but then what start happening is you DCs go, let's well, slant. Let's start slanting and blitzing. And that's kind of what combats it. So it's a we've said it a million times, a chess game. Yep. But to get out of that, that's what we would do. But then some offensive coordinators need to hear this. If the run play doesn't work, then don't do or like if it gets stopped, then get out of it and go do something else. But what do I know? Don't be your head against the wall. I'm from the corn. I don't know. What do I know? But now, should- I will, will say, like, okay, you ran inside zone and, like, the freak D lineman made a heck of a play. Like, you shouldn't just cancel your whole inside zone scheme. Now, if it's happened five times, you probably shouldn't have allowed it to happen five times. You should have two times ago called a different play. But um, I think there's some of that, too. Sometimes the defense is going to get lucky in the right call. Um, don't necessarily cancel your whole game plan. No, but it's both sides, defense and offense. Yep. If that happens, I, as the old line coach or run game, going to have to make an adjustment of like, oh, his three tech is making the play. Let's double team. If he's got a, if you've got a really good three tech and we just can't double team him, we'll read him. So as a defense, and you know, okay, they're in our three tech. Now I can do something different with my DN. I can do something different with the backer. We can just always make the three tech crash in and bring a backer over. Like there's, you could just keep nitpick or keep moving things. Yep. And, and I think that's what I guess Illinois, like high school football, I'm most jealous of is I feel like that game with the no huddle sideline technology is way more of a chess match than maybe small college football where I got two other guys on my staff, one guy's in the box, the other guy's on the sideline. Because we're not seeing that stuff, everything. We're not seeing everything until Sunday morning. Yes, we can make the adjustment. Hey, you're going to be on a slant. Go from outside leverage to inside leverage and different things. But um, to be able to put in, not necessarily a new scheme, but to be able to put a new scheme in the middle of the game, like that's dangerous in my world because I'm not going to see that until Sunday to see how it all shakes out. Um, But I think that is interesting in the high school game is – you're able to, hey, let's try something this next drive and see if it worked, and then coach off of that. The only frustrating thing is depends on your depth. So the small schools that have huddle sideline, they for us, we did that. I only had three old linemen that really didn't play defense. So sometimes I only had three starting linemen over there with me. So I could tweak with them, but then it's like, you got to go tell so-and-so and so-and-so. Yeah. So some of our adjustments were at halftime. Like yep. I could keep notes. I could tell whoever, but then at halftime I can make the adjustment. That's still huge after halftime for a DC for the other side. Like we're going to do this. Now when I was at Lombard East and we had just an offense and just a defense, that whole sideline was huge because literally during the game we could come over and say, Hey, this inside zone, let's just start double team instead of just stepping one way around a double team. Yep. That small little tweak makes it look different. Yep. Or like, hey, when we arc release, instead of blocking for the outside guy, why don't you just turn it back inside? Like, just little tweaks. So it was huge in that school. And there's so much of that stuff that now another team's breaking you down, and they're like, why You know, why are they doing this? You know, Normally they didn't do it. Now they're double teaming. All right, we got to prepare for that. But that was a tweak you made that you're probably back to your normal rules by the next week. That other yep. team's – watching on film and being like, man, what's going on? Like, you know, cutups will lie to you a lot because that's where watching the game in sequence will help you out a little bit. Like, oh, they ran power this way the first half. The second half, this was their adjustment. But that's another thing with the young coaches. They got to figure out how to watch film. So like you said, going back to the original, how do they watch on sideline? Then do you have your staff with you on Saturday? If you have volunteer coaches in high school, do they have to come Saturday mornings? Not all the time. So they do they know how to watch film? Yeah. I'm not saying I'm a professional. At it. You're way better than I am, but I know from doing it 12, 13 years, kind of what I'm looking for and what's going on. Yep. But that's another thing with young coaches. Do you know how to watch film? Do you know what it's going to look like? Do you know what the DC is looking for? Do you know what the OC is looking for? Do you understand what, like on NFL, is this an RPO or is this play action? Like, do you understand what that looks like? Yep. When the old line is moving downfield, it's an RPO. When they back up, it's a play action. Like, do we know? Yep. Um, all right. I know that was a waste of your time. I'll let you go now. It's probably a waste of your time, but I'm getting back into it. Uh, I have to get you back on to present something at some yeah. point. It was a pleasure. If anyone has any questions, reach out to me. I'll, I'll share whatever 
Um, I can. And you have YouTube channel and stuff too, right? Yep. YouTube spread defense, uh, the Twitter accounts at coach Nick Davis at uh, spread defense. Got a uh, coach tube, a um, few coach tube courses, how to build defense. So if you're interested in any of that, um, I got a, a pretty nice course on how to build a defense from the, the bottom up. I'll have to check it out at one point so I know what defenses are doing to me. <laughs> All, All right, right, Coach. Thank you. Yep.